Hi folks, the word of God it says in Romans chapter 1, Paul a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God which he promised to fall by his prophets and the holy scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and, accord and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among whom are you also the called of Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome beloved of God called to be saints grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome beloved of God called to be saints Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers making requests by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Some spiritual gift. Now I would not have you ignorant brethren that oftentimes I put purpose to come to you but was let hereafter that I might have some fruit among you also even as among other Gentiles. I am a debitor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So here it says, for I'm not ashamed of the power, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Here the Lord is saying that, Paul is saying that he's not ashamed of the gospel. He's not ashamed of the gospel, for Jesus Christ shed his blood. For Jesus Christ shed his blood and gave his life that you and I may go free. He's not ashamed of it because he knows that Jesus Christ can set us free. He knows that Christ can deliver us. He knows that Christ shed his blood. When Christ came, he came to deliver us and save us from the power of sin. You see, God is a holy God. The Bible says that God is a holy God. It says, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. God is a holy God and God is a great God. And in order to know God, in order to have a relationship with Him, we cannot do it in our own strength. We cannot do it in our own ability. We can't do it in our own strength and in our own ability. So God came down in Jesus Christ. God came down in Jesus Christ and accomplished the salvation for you and me. Jesus Christ accomplished that salvation for you and me. Something that you and I could not do, He did for us by coming down in human flesh. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Christ came to this world and He came to this world for a reason and a purpose. And that was to deliver us from the wrath to come. It was to deliver us from the wrath to come. One day there's going to be an end to the world. One day there's going to be a day of judgment. 
One day God's going to open the books and He's going to judge every single one of us. He's going to open those books and every single secret of your heart and my heart will be shown. What do you say? He's going to open the books. He's going to open the books of Day of Judgment. And when He opens those books on the Day of Judgment, the great question will be, what did you do with Jesus Christ? What did you do with Him? Did you believe Him? Did you put your faith in Him? Did you repent and trust in Him? What did you do with Him? Amen, amen. Amen. God bless you. He's helped you. Amen. 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 God bless you, Mom. Amen. 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 God has helped her. She's saying God has helped her. Amen. So she's bearing witness to the lady, the homeless lady, that she's prayed to God and God has helped her. Amen. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, Paul was not ashamed of the gospel because he knew that the only way to be saved, the only way to be forgiven, I am a... Can I just say as well, I have my stuff stolen off me and karma and God brought that person back to me and then I end up giving my sleeping bag to them because I thought, you know what, if you found my sleeping bag, I said, you bring take my coat off me and he said, God didn't tell you to unclothe me. I said, no, it is not, you don't steal or rob off people. So at the end of the day, he brought the person to me and I, then I, in favour, give him my sleeping bag. Amen. Thank you, Lord. God bless you. God, God bless you. Me. God bless you. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. God bless you. For it is the power of God unto salvation. It is the only way to be saved. There is no other way. How can you be saved? You can be saved by the Son of God who came down and took upon Himself human flesh. And there He died on that cross and took your sin away. That is the only way to know God. The only way to know your sins are forgiven is to believe on Christ who shed His blood and gave His life for you on that cross. There is no other way, my friend. No other way. You cannot get into heaven. God bless you. you. You cannot get into heaven by any other way. There is only one way, and that way is by the Son of God. The Son of God who shed His blood and died on your behalf. There He hung on that cross. And when He hung on that cross, He shed His blood and died in your place. That if you repent and say, Sorry Lord for breaking His law, breaking the Ten Commandments, and if you say, Sorry, O Lord, and cry out to Him, and go to the cross, and say, Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, cleanse me. Lord, Lord, forgive me. He will forgive you. He will forgive you if you go to Him. He will forgive you if you go to Him in the night. He will forgive you if you go to Him in the morning. He will forgive you if you go to Him in the afternoon. But if you come to Christ and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, 
then He will forgive you. He will forgive you because He died and took the wrath of God upon Himself. And there, when He hung on that cross, He shed His blood as a sacrifice for the things that you did wrong. Everything that you did wrong, everything that you did wrong, He died on your behalf and shed His blood on your behalf. And if you cry out to Him and say, Lord, have mercy upon me, He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will show you His mercy. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And if you come to Christ and say, Lord, have mercy upon me, He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. And He'll wash you of your mistakes. Whatever mistakes you have made, you can have a second chance today because He gave His life for you on that cross. That old hymn, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. The Prince of Glory died for you on that cross. The Prince of Glory died that you may have life. That you may have life. He died for you. He died for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe to the Jew first and also to the Greek he's not ashamed because he knows that Christ can wash you clean that Christ can forgive you. That Christ can make you anew. That Christ can set you free. That Christ can deliver you. Amen. He's not ashamed of the gospel. For the gospel can clean you up. And the gospel can forgive you. And the gospel can change you. The gospel is good news. The gospel is good news. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth. To the Jew first. And also to the Greek. Whether you're black or whether you're white, whether you're gay or whether you're a lesbian, whether you're Chinese or Japanese, whether you're a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Muslim, whether you're an atheist or an agnostic, whoever you are today, Christ can save you. Christ can deliver you. Christ can help you. For Christ died for you on that cross. There he was nailed for you. He was nailed to the cross. And Paul said, we preach Christ crucified. There we preach Christ crucified. There the Son of God shed his blood and gave his life for you. 
Shed his blood, nailed to the cross. The Son of God, nailed to that cross. There he hung on that cross, the Son of God. And the darkness came over the earth. And there he died for you. There everything that you ever did wrong, every wrong that you ever did, he died for you in your place and hung on that cross for you that you wouldn't go to hell, that you wouldn't have to go to hell. He went to hell for you and hung on the cross taking your punishment and taking your wrath. The wrath of God fell upon him for you. The wrath of God fell upon him for you. And there he suffered. There he suffered and hung on the tree, on the cross, as a saviour for you. He hung there, shedding his blood, shedding his blood for you, shedding his blood, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. All sin. Whatever bad things you have done in your life that you regret. Whatever it is in your life that you regret, my friend. All your sin can be forgiven today. Every last drop of your sin can be forgiven. Every drop of your mistake can be forgiven. And you can be cleansed and you can be washed and you can be a new creature in Christ. For His love is deep and His love is great and His love is merciful and His love is kind and He can clean you up right now. He can clean you up of your drugs he can clean you up of your pride. He can clean you up, my friends. Assalamu alaikum. Do whatever the fuck you want, because just pray and then everything's all right. Jesus, Jesus died for you, yeah? God bless you. <laughs> Don't know what that was about. Everything you've ever done wrong, any mistakes that you have made can be washed clean right now. You can have a second chance today. You can be forgiven today. You can be cleansed today. You can be washed today in the blood of the Lamb. Behold, says John, behold, behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold Him. Behold the Lamb that shed His blood. Behold the Lamb that laid down His life. Behold the Lamb that was broken that his body was broken for you. Behold him. Behold the Lamb. Behold him that gave his life a ransom for you. Hey, mate, how are you doing? You all right? Behold the Lamb that shed his blood. Behold him who gave his life for you to save you from the pit of hell. The pit of hell where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The pit of hell where you wake up and cry and lament and cry and weep as you burn in hell. The burning of hell 
is knowing that God is a holy God and He hates unholiness. That is hell. To wake up in hell is to know that God is holy and we are not holy. That is hell. And oh, that He saved us from hell. That He saved you from hell by going to the cross and shedding His blood for you. Mind if I can ask a question? Yeah. What's the, uh, the rooster on top of the church? What does it symbolize? The rooster? Uh, it depends which church. I should imagine it's in, in referring to um, when the cock crew, you know, right. three times and Peter denied him. So is that about indifference? What, what do you mean? What do you mean? I'll keep the camera that way, yeah? Peter, I, I wouldn't mind anyways. Okay. Peter you don't give a turn Peter, around? Yeah, for sure. Peter okay. should have turned around and said Jesus was my friend, right? That's why the rooster was crowing to tell him that he was doing something wrong. Could, could you say that again? Peter should have turned, turned around and said out loud that Jesus is my friend instead of pretending that he wasn't, right? Yeah, yeah. So it was, the rooster crowing was God's message to tell Peter that he had done something that wasn't quite right yeah. or could have been better. Yeah, so yeah. do you think that the rooster on top of the church then re represents indifference of people and that, that that's why wickedness is so prevalent in the world today because the indifference of good people could change the evil of the world? That's a good point, yeah. That's, I think that's something in that, yeah. yeah, yeah I think but so but I, think, I think with Peter, with, with all of us, we pretend to be the man and we, the big man and, and then when it comes to it, we, we cower. And he cowered. He thought he was the big man. That's a good point. But, but he, he lost the courage. But the wonderful thing is about that, and it shows you the love of Jesus. At the end, when the Lord rose again, he came to see Peter. And he said to Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, you know, I love you. He said, well, feed my lambs. And he said it three times. And so the Lord restored Peter and used him. And, and God doesn't throw away his people when they fail. You know, David failed. He had Bathsheba. That wasn't his wife, he killed Uriah, he failed, but God still used him. You know, Moses failed, uh, he, he was, wanted to be proud, he was a bit proud near the end, but God still used him, um, you know, and in the Bible it shows that it's the truth because it shows the weakness of the leaders, it doesn't brush it over and hide it. You know, Solomon had a thousand wives, you know, that's how weak he was. And, and the Bible doesn't throw that under the carpet and hide it from us, it shows us that men are weak. But in our weakness, when we are weak, we are strong. When we're weak and we don't have any strength, God will help us. And God will help you and me if we... But if we're proud, and that was the problem with the Pharisees. The Pharisees thought they were, they, they were righteous and they knew it all and they had it all together. And they were judging the tax collectors and the prostitutes. And they thought they don't have it together, but we have it together. But Jesus said, woe to the Pharisees. And he went to the tax collectors, he went to the prostitutes. Or the whips. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's kind of interesting, the company you kept for considering the saying uh, that you judge by the company that you keep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Do you have a nice do, do, I, got, you, I got to run. Do, do you have any beliefs or...? Um, multi, multi-faith. Multi. Basically all based off of the, the, the Old Testament, but... Are you Jewish? Um, Christian, Jewish and Muslim, I guess. Okay, so you're like a mixture of everything. Well... All, all of them recognize Jesus and Moses and well, but the... Do, do you believe Jesus uh, was God incarnate or God the Son? Like, that he, that he was I like God? I don't know, because he, he, he repeatedly asks the apostles, who am I? And if he was God, it seems that he would just not only say I am God, but prove that he was God there and then, you know what I mean? So yeah. it's, it, it, if that was the case, it seems like it should, be, should have been clearer. For, for me, from, okay. from the scriptures well, that I've read. If you get a chance, read the Gospel of John and look at the word I am. Uh -huh. And that's that's a, something that the Lord... I am where he says that I am the way and the life. Yeah, he that. goes, I am the way, the truth and the life. He says, before Abraham was, I am. I think that's in uh, John 6. Uh -huh. John 6, I think it is, yeah. I would actually or like John to have Hicks. that conversation, but okay. I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the time. Well, thank me. you so much for your time. But thank, thank you. you. Thank God you bless you. Time, man. Thank you. God, God bless you. Bless you. God bless you. Take care. God bless you. So we were talking there uh, about the divinity of Christ and um, Jesus uses the word I am as a title uh, in the Gospel of John and that word I am is used by God in, uh, in Exodus chapter 3 I think it is where the burning of the bush and um, God says I am 
and Jesus uses the same title in the Gospel of John. So, so that is a reference to his divinity. And no prophet ever said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, like the Lord said in John uh, 14. So, you know, Christ is God in the flesh, and he came to die for us and give his life for us. And he come for the, for the, for the lost. And if you feel lost, if you feel needy today, you can find the love of God. And that's why we're here today. God bless you, and we'll carry on. Paul said, God bless you. Paul said, how are you doing, you okay? Yeah, you carry on, I'll just pray. You carry on, let us have pray. Okay, thank you. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. My friends, the only way to know God is through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. He is the one that shed his blood. He is the one that laid down his life. He is the one that died on that cross for you. He is the only way to be saved. The only way to heaven. The only way to heaven is Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father but through me. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but through me. He is the only way to heaven. The only way to heaven is Jesus Christ. There is no other way. No prophet, no leader, no man on this world or planet can help you but Jesus. Only He can help you. For He defied death. He rose again and conquered death. He conquered death. And one day he's coming back. Every prophet is in the ground today. Every leader is in the ground today that dies. But Christ died and rose again. He conquered death. And no matter how much we advance in science, no matter how much we advance in our knowledge, we have not learned to conquer death. Death will come for you one day. Death will take you down one day. Death will take you into the empty grave one day. And when death comes to you, the only hope that you have on your deathbed is Jesus Christ the Savior. Only Christ can help you on your deathbed. Only Christ can help you. For Christ died and rose again. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He conquered death. And if you want to conquer death, if you want to know everything's okay in your life and be a new person, if you want to conquer death, the person to believe in is Jesus Christ. He will never fail you. He will never let you down. He will never forsake you. He will always be your friend. He will always be your saviour if you put your faith in Him. He will always be there to help you if you trust in Him. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord says, I am the good shepherd that gave His life for the sheep. Drugs ain't your shepherd. Your pension ain't your shepherd. Your PhD ain't your shepherd. Your fiddling the gas bill and the electric bill ain't your shepherd. Your shepherd is Jesus Christ, the saviour of your soul, who shed his blood to save you. So repent. You are commanded to repent. And if you do not repent, there is only one place for you, my friend, and that is hell. 
If you do not repent, then hell awaits you, my friend. If you do not repent, then hell awaits you, whether you like it or not. It awaits you, for you have rejected your salvation. You have rejected what God has given you. You have said no to God and yes to the devil. You have said no to heaven and yes to hell. And hell is where you will go and weep if you reject him. Have you got any questions, sir? Yeah, um, what about the kids who died on the road? If they didn't repent their sins, are they going to hell? What's that? Could you say that again? People who died in that arena, if they didn't repent their sins, are they going to hell? Do, do, do you know their hearts? No, I don't. No. If they didn't repent, are they going to hell? I don't know their hearts. I can't so judge. Can, if you don't know their hearts, how can you say Because I'm not God. Yeah, but if you say that... If don't it's God who judges. Going to hell. How can you say that? You, you don't know. You don't know if they have or not. You know just about me, mate. I, I don't know you. It's not for me to judge you. And what's it for you to judge someone else? I don't even know you, so it's not for me to judge you. And what is it for you to judge someone else? Well, well, what my job is to preach a message of repentance and belief in Jesus. That's my job, right? It's your job to believe. He is judging. So it's, can, can I finish? It's your job. It's my job as a preacher to preach, if you believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. If you don't, you'll go to hell. That's my job. God's job is to convince you. Your job is to repent and believe. It's not my job to judge you. I can't judge you. Then why are you saying that if they don't, if you can't, if you don't know those people, how can you judge them and where Because I, my friend, I don't know any individual person here. Exactly. Yeah, How can you judge but, but I can say from scripture, my friend, Jesus says this in John 3.16. It's a good question. He says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So it's saying there, if you believe in Jesus, you won't perish. And it goes on to say, if you don't believe, you will perish. So it, I can say, if you don't believe, you will perish, you will go to hell. Okay? But I can't judge you. Amen. Is a good preach? Thanks, love. Thank you. So, have you got any other questions, mate? Yeah, your clothes different fabrics. Pardon? Your clothes different fabrics. That's your wrappers? It says in the Bible as well, you can't mix fabrics. <laughs> okay, alright. That's a good question. Are you an atheist, by the way? Yes, I am. Okay. This is a typical thing that atheists bring up, bro, about fabrics and things. They, what they don't understand is lo the law in the Old Testament. There are three types of law. There's moral law which is the Ten Commandments, right? Can I finish? Can I finish? There's moral law, which is the Ten Commandments, which is for all time, which is love your neighbor as yourself, summed up, yeah? Love God and love your neighbor. Then there's the ceremonial law. Those are laws for national Israel, yeah? So they don't apply to us, right? That was for Israel for a particular time. The ceremonial law has been done away with. Surely if you're following it. No, because Jesus, if you read the book of Hebrews, Jesus fulfills the whole law. That's why he came, he fulfilled it all. So now that we believe in him and trust in him, 
and follow him and walk in the spirit and obey the Ten Commandments but in the spirit that's what we do but we don't obey the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law we can learn lessons of and the lessons are to be to, to that you can learn practical lessons from those laws like God is holy and God wants purity in, in, in his people and the spiritual <laughs> lessons that you can learn but that, that's a, an argument that a lot of atheists use but it doesn't apply to Christianity because Christianity the default position for a Christian is Christ. We interpret the Old Testament from Christ's eyes, the way Christ sees it, yeah? It's still there, it's still a part of it. It's still there, yeah, and we, and we honour that because Jesus said it's the word of God, he quoted that. So you honour the Old Testament? Yeah, yeah. So you honour the death of homosexuals then? No, no, you, we honour the Old Testament as the word of God. No, no, you can't pick and choose what parts of the Testament you follow, though. If you pick one part of it and ignore the others, you're cherry picking. <laughs> Alright, right, can, can, can I come in? Yeah, but we have a right as Christians to interpret the way we understand it. You have a right as an atheist to understand it and interpret it. We understand the Old Testament through Christ's eyes. Christ is the new covenant, yeah? So it's not cherry picking. Our hermeneutic, our way of interpreting the Old Testament is the way Christ interpreted it. Okay? Is that a fair point? No, no, you are cherry picking. Well, if it was, you, if you, if you was an atheist and were consistent, you would understand you have the Old Testament and then you have the New Testament. Yeah. And what you're doing is, you're interpreting the Old Testament as if the New Testament never existed. No, no, I have both. If you, if you read Jeremiah chapter 31, yeah. it says a new covenant, I will put their laws within their hearts. Yeah. Jesus said when he came to Nicodemus, he said, he knew all the law, but he said you must be born again. I meaning born in the spirit, because they were obeying, the Pharisees were obeying the outward, but it, Jesus was saying it's not just the outward, it's the inward. And the Old Testament, there was a lot of outward stuff to obey. But it wasn't just about that, it was about the heart. And that's what Jesus came to teach, that we have to follow in our hearts. That we have to have a... Jesus said, no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So Jesus shows us, he's the model of how to live and how to interpret the Old Testament. So we don't follow Richard Dawkins, he's not our hermeneutic. We don't follow Sam Harris, we follow Jesus. He's our way of understanding the Old Testament and that's legitimate. What you're doing is, as an atheist, you're coming at it from a, a, a hermeneutic that there's no New Testament and we just interpret the Old Testament as it is. That is not our position. I'm not coming from that because again, you say you can't I have studied I've studied the Jews. Yeah. I've studied both the New Testament and the Old Testament itself. Yeah, yeah, go on. But I still find that the Old Testament that you have, that you are cherry picking from it. Because if you're trying to interpret it to fix your whims and to fix your beliefs, and you're just ignoring it as a whole, where there is murder, there is death in there, where they do promote death, murder of homosexuals, and women who commit adultery, and people who do not believe in it. Yeah. So how could you ignore that that is apparently your word from your faith yeah, yeah. and not take that as fact? I have studied the New Testament and it's miles what better Jesus, than the old. What did Jesus say to the people when they brought the woman to, her, to him that has committed adultery? Yeah. What did Jesus say to the people when they brought the woman? He says, this woman was caught in the act of adultery itself. And he says, the law says she should be stoned to death. What did Jesus say to the people? I don't think I can remember that one myself, no. Okay. But well, he showed, he sh what he's saying there is that, that passage, some scholars say it's not in the Bible, it is in the Bible, there's evidence for it, just, just in case any atheist is listening to that. It is in the Bible and he's right what he's saying. What he's saying is Jesus didn't advocate stoning that lady like the Pharisees would have to follow the Old Testament. He said, go away, sin no more. But I, I understand what you're saying. What you're saying is, look, the stuff in the Old Testament that's pretty gory, and you can't just hide it from you can't just hide away from it. That's what you're saying, basically. Yeah. yeah. I don't disagree with that. We we don't hide away from it. We can go to it and we can explain passages and look at those passages in detail. Alright? 
I don't, I don't agree with this like we just put it under this carpet and we hide. All I am saying is we have a legitimate way of understanding the Old Testament, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we hide from some of the difficult passages. All right, There are difficult passages. But then if the shoe was on the other foot, you're judging the Old Testament. I'm going to put a question to you as an atheist now. If you're judging the Old Testament and saying the Old Testament's gory and got things wrong with it and you disagree with it and we're cherry picking, where do you get right and wrong from? If you do you believe in evolution? Yes. Right? So where do you get right and wrong from? How can you say objectively that you're right and the Old Testament is wrong? What is your standard if you believe in evolution? Because there's scientific backing for evolution, there's documents, there's bone records, there's fossil records, there's actual specimens that we can look at and realise that we did come from primates and that we did come from Africa and we did evolve. Yeah. Yeah and not just from the word of someone, there is actual evidence for it. So that's where I get my right and wrong from, of how we evolved as humans. All right, so let, let's grant that evolution's true. I don't agree with that. I don't believe that myself. But let's grant that is, that still doesn't answer the question of how you get from evolution to right and wrong, because evolution, in the evolutionary scale... Right, so can, 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 from morals, can, Yeah, can I just finish, right. can I just finish? In nature, yeah. nature doesn't tell you what's right and wrong. Philosophers, philosophers talk about what is called the is-ought problem. Yeah. David Hume, a philosopher, an English philosopher, mentioned this. And what this is, is you can't get an ought, what to do, from an is. You can't get how to live your life from nature, what is. Because nature doesn't tell you what's right and wrong. So how do you get right and wrong, what is right and wrong, from nature? when it doesn't tell you what's right and wrong. Well, you don't get it from nature, you get it from your own moral code, you get it from how you were brought up as a person. But I come from a traditional working class family where both parents were civil servants. I come from a family that is not in a very nice place in Manchester, and I've been raised how I've been raised. It's not from nature, it's from nurture. That's where the clear disconnect is from, nurture and nature. So yeah, you've got your okay. words written from how okay. you should live your life, and I have mine, which is how I've been brought up, how I've been taught in school, college, and further, how I've been taught from my friends and family. I mean, okay, God from bless you. And, like, okay. And learn and from error. experiences, trial and error. I don't need the word of someone else how to live my life because that's how I should be able to live it. And there's proof of evolution. There's fossil records that you can search that, not to offend you, but are more tangible than words that were written on animal skins or words that were written from scholars that claim to have seen God but there's no actual evidence apart from witnesses and testimonies from divine intervention. There's still no proof of a deity. There's still no proof of God. Now there is proof of a man who, who's fixed, it, who fixed the identity of Jesus. There's actual proof of that, that there was a man called Jesus who was at that time considered that. It's debatable whether he was the son of God but in my own opinion, he wasn't. But again, there's proof of evolution and I don't see how you can reject that, okay. where you can take the words of someone else as fact, but not scientific data that's been proven trial and error over and over and over again. Okay, okay. can I come back here? You said a few things. Yeah. Can I come back? You said about uh, you get your morals from uh, culture, nurture, yeah. but you still haven't got out of the problem, you're in the evolutionary process, logically, if you're in the evolutionary process, you're an animal. Okay, so if you're an animal, you're an animal, you can't just say, well, I'm not an animal, I'm, I don't behave like an animal, you are, if you're an evolutionist, an animal. So, so if you're doing moral things that are good, as opposed to being an animal, then there's a contradiction there. Secondly, if you say, because, because animals don't know what what evil is, don't know what, what, what good is. They, they, they I think some animals do have a grasp on what's good and bad. Well, if, if my, a chimp... My, my dog knows not to stick uh, her paw into the fire because she knows it's going to burn. Yeah, but if... She the, knows not to go after bigger dogs because she knows she's going to get attacked. Okay. That's the difference between right and wrong. She knows how to sit okay. and act nicely between us because that's how she's been conditioned from us. Can I, can I come in though? You, you said a lot. Could yeah. I just come in? Yeah. yeah, but the dog's not going to get arrested. It's not going to be put in prison. It's not morally culpable before the law. Okay. No, it can be put down. It can be put into a it, shelter, though. It's not responsible morally speaking according to the law. Okay. All right. Well, let me finish my points. Right. Okay. If you go for culture, yeah. different cultures have different morality. Yeah. So just because your culture says 
that the Old Testament's wrong, it's just your culture. There are other cultures might agree with the Old Testament. So can I finish? Because yeah. you, you, right? yeah, yeah. culture doesn't give you an absolute morality, right? And when you're saying the Old Testament's wrong, if you say it's just my opinion, that's okay. But if you're saying that it's wrong per se, then where do you get your absolute from culture? You don't, okay? Hitler thought he was right, that was his culture, right? Other cultures disagree with him, right? So culture, it doesn't give you an absolute morality. It's still relative. The third thing is about evolution. You're saying that there's better to believe in evolution than it is to, to believe in, in the parchments and things like that. I didn't say it was better, I said there's more facts. All right, well, well, let's just look at that just for a second and then I'll let you rebut me and come back to me. The resurrection claims to have eyewitnesses, right? There are eyewitnesses in 1 John chapter 1, it says eyewitnesses. In Luke chapter 1, it says eyewitnesses. In the book of John, Gospel of John, it talks about the beloved disciple was an eyewitness, Matthew was an eyewitness, and Mark wrote on behalf of Peter, who was an eyewitness, right? So has anybody ever witnessed, eyewitnessed, macro-evolution? Not, not micro-evolution, rabbits changing to bigger rabbits, but has anybody seen rabbits change, I mean, I'm being a bit facetious and silly, but a rabbit changing into a... a a dinosaur. Has anybody seen macroevolution take place with their own eyes? Because the science. Because evolution takes hundreds upon hundreds of years to take place. If you look at Ch if, if you look at Charles Darwin when he went to the Galapagos Islands and when he was discovering different species of birds, he discovered different species of birds that had grown different forms of beaks to eat different kinds of food. And they had one common ancestor that was here, and then they branched off because some of them were living in more tropical regions, so they were eating more fruits and berries, so they developed a different beak. Some were eating creatures, so they had to develop a sharp beak to kill its prey. But they, these were things that were taken over hundreds and hundreds of years that he had to experiment through bone records. Now, myself, I've never seen a Neanderthal in the flesh because they went extinct 2,000 years ago. That's just a fact. They went extinct. They're not. They're not around anymore. But I have seen bones. And I have seen excavation sites of humans' common ancestor. What I haven't seen is someone being resurrected from the dead. I've not seen someone turn a river into river of blood. I've not seen someone turn water into wine. I've not seen God, but I've seen proof of evolution. I've not seen it with my own eyes. I've not seen a chimp come down from a tree and start using stone tools because I wasn't around. I was born in 1999, this happened millions of years ago, but there's still proof of it. Okay. And there's, eyewit there's eyewitnesses that people have seen leprechauns, doesn't mean they're right. Okay, okay. There's people that have said that they've seen the Loch Ness Monster, again, no proof. There's people who've seen the Bigfoot, no proof, eyewitnesses. But with evolution, you go, this bone was from a common ancestor that we had thousands of years ago, you can see comparisons between Neanderthals and humans, different skull densities, different bone textures, different lengths of bones, because they, they were taller than us by record, and also they had different diet sources and completely different cultures to us that were documented. There's proof of that. There's no proof that Jesus died and came back to life apart from witness testimonies. Because I can tell you right now, I've just witnessed a dragon fly over towards Deansgate. Mm. Doesn't mean it's happened. Mm. Mm. So I don't see how eyewitnesses should be taken as fact. They should be looked into, no doubt. And I'm not disagreeing with you on that. Eyewitness accounts are used in all accounts of things. They're used in crime. They're used in things where people have seen something and go, I've seen that, and they're taken as trust. Okay, can I come back because I'm running out? Yep. Running. No. On, when you're talking about bones, um, you're talking about bones that we see. I'm on a. It's about the process. Nobody's ever witnessed the process. Because it takes thousands yeah, of years. Yeah, yeah. So the process is nobody's ever witnessed it. We've yeah, tried. We have, have no, no, can, can I just finish? Can I just finish? Because you, you've had a lot to say. Um, if you look at uh, recent research in bacteria from 1980 to the pre present time, they try to uh, make bacteria multiply it over thousands of generations, which is equivalent to millions of years in human life, and they still found that it's bacteria. Nobody's actually ever witnessed with their own eyes in a scientific experiment where they've seen macroevolution. Big changes take place, right? Dr. Meyer, who's world authority in evolution, says that evolution is a historical science. And what that means, it's going back into the past and interpreting the past. 
with a particular theory. That doesn't necessarily prove your point that evolutions took place. It's going back to the data with a theory and explaining the historical past because nobody's ever actually witnessed the actual process itself. I'll give you an example. In textbooks of schools, you know the moth, do you remember the moths? They changed the moths, yeah? Well, apparently that's been going in textbook schools for many, many years. But the moss that they used didn't actually land on the trees the way they showed it, right? And even moss changing colour doesn't mean that the moths have changed into, into something else. You talked about Darwin's finches. They're still finches. They've changed into different sizes of finches, but they're still, but they're still finches. No, them. That's yes, because the, they're not going to change wait, the species. Wait, can, can I just finish? It's microevolution, not macroevolution. Okay. It's not macroevolution, it's microevolution. And so you're making a logical jump just because it changes size and colour, the finches, that somehow the finches are going to be the dinosaurs. That's a logical jump, all right? No, now, now, no. Now, can I just get to the evidence, just one minute, and then I'll let you come in and then it'll finish, yeah? On the evidence of Jesus, yeah, you're right, you're right about just because someone says they're eyewitnesses. You've got to look at the quality of the eyewitnesses, the background information to the eyewitnesses, whether the eyewitnesses are consistent, and, and, etc. The quality of the eyewitnesses. We know that the people came in the first century because they get exactly right the archaeology of the times. They know where the pools are, the gates are of Jerusalem, etc. So we know that these people who witnessed the resurrection came from that time. Secondly, the quality. When you get enemies of the, of the Christianity saying that they've witnessed Jesus, like Paul, Paul was an enemy, right? He says he witnessed it. Now when you get multiple different types of eyewitnesses in different contexts, so you get women, you get individuals, you get groups, no psychological profile today can match all the different psychological and social uh, variety of the resurrection. So you had women, you had individuals, you had groups. Now if you're doing psychology and you're looking into eyewitnesses, you know, the, the models are only based on one or two studies of, 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 of a group or an individual. But the variety shows you that there's something unusual happening here. He, most scholars will grant you, most scholars will grant you, even if they don't believe in a supernatural revel uh, miracle, they will grant you that the eyewitness, that they believe that the uh, disciples believe that, they, 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 that, that Jesus rose again. So if they did believe that, we've got to ask the question, why did they believe that? Were they lying? Were they deluded? Or did they really see it? And then finally, women's testimony was not worth anything in the time of Jesus, right? And it was the women who saw Jesus first. So if you were starting a religion, you wouldn't use women, all right? Women was not valued in the time of Jesus. It was half of that of a man in law courts. And yet if you read the gospels and the gospels spread throughout the whole ancient world, the gospels show that it was the women who saw Jesus first. So those are just some of the like, historical evidences and the basic background information like Jesus dying on a cross, Dominic Crossan says Jesus dying on a cross who's a skeptic, Jesus dying on a cross is one of the most well attested facts in ancient history. And then finally you mentioned miracles, you've never seen a miracle. But that means as an atheist, because of quantum physics you don't know what's going to pop into existence or not from the quantum level. So what that means is you should be open to the data, to the evidence. You can't just rule out miracles and say they've never happened because you only know like not even half a percent of the universe. There's, there's dark matter that we don't even understand. Yeah. So you should be open to the, to the evidence. And so it's not a case of, I don't believe in miracles. It's a case of, you should say, wait a minute, I don't know if a miracle could happen or not. I don't know if there's a God or not. But what I'll do is I'll read the gospels with an open mind and see if those miracles make sense with the data, all right? And I would just say, just just go and read the Gospels and be open to the data. I'm going to let you finish because you've been good. It's going to end in a minute. So do you want to say one last thing? This is going on my channel, jasonburnspreacher.com. Okay, so you can go there. I debate in Hyde Park and I preach and stuff. So, you, you know, it won't be edited. It'll just be left like this, yeah? So do you want to give the last words? Um... Well, I just want to say... You and just say an atheist. You're a good atheist. You're a nice atheist. Thank you. Yeah, yeah same to you. Um, your, your last point, you make the last point. I guess for me myself, I've never seen conclusive evidence of a God. I've never seen it, I've yet to see it. I, I debate whether it is true or not, because through some of the experience I've had in my life, I would question that divine intervention should have happened 
in those circumstances and they've not. You know, previously I was religious from a very young age. I did sort of believe in it, but not much. And as I grew, I noticed that the evidence that it just wasn't there anymore for me. So that's all that I have to say, really. I've not seen it. Yeah, I have seen evidence of all the other things that have made the world, like the Big Bang, evidence like that. So yeah. that's all I base my beliefs on. Well, our message is that Jesus died for us on that cross, that he gave his life for us. And I, I, I was always skeptic when I was young. I, I was brought up a Jehovah's Witness, but I was always skeptic. I always thought they were nutters. Religious people were nutters, yeah? But I, I, I began to be convicted of my sin, and I began to realize that I was a sinner. And there's one thing after reading Bertrand's, uh, Bertrand Russell's history of Western philosophy, there's one thing that I couldn't get my head around was Jesus. And if you read about him, I, you can't get your head around him. He's bigger than our concept. And I came to realize that if you trust him, you can, have your, you can be forgiven and you can have this relationship with God. That we're not just a speck of dust on the edge of the universe. And, and that we're life's a bitch and then we die. But that there's more to life, that there is a meaning to it and a purpose. And for me, if there is no God, then there is no meaning. It's just a private thing that we put on it and there's no purpose. But if there is a God, there is a meaning and a purpose and, and there is, a, a, there is a, a logical reason why we live. That is to love God and love our neighbour as ourselves, mate. And you're a lovely atheist and it's been a great honour and privilege to talk to you. And you've been very, very respectful. So, thank you very much. You're a credit to atheism, mate. Alright, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Take care. My name's Jason Burns. If you type in Jason Burns, preacher.com, it'll be up tonight sometime. Okay, God bless you.